Hi, welcome to our ProV Academy series on tech terms, where we sit down with Alistair Chapman and chat through some of the technical terms that just come up again and again in this industry. Alistair is one of the best people I know at explaining complex technical concepts. So hopefully, just by casually chatting with him each one of these terms through, these videos can just help clear up some of the confusion that might be out there on each of these terms. Today we're discussing what a colour gamut is, and which one you should have selected. So gamut is an interesting one. I think a lot of people at first confuse gamut with gamma, yes. but they are very different things, aren't they? Well, they are different, but gamma is part of gamut. Mm -hmm. So the word gamut means essentially everything or all of, and so the gamut of a camera is everything that the camera can see or everything that the camera can capture. Um, mm -hmm. If you're talking about a recording format or a recording uh, standard, the gamut is everything that's in there. So it's both colour and contrast and brightness range. So it really is everything that the camera can see. Generally, when we're talking about gamut, though, we tend to be talking about the colour aspect yep. because we have gamma, which describes the contrast, brightness aspect uh, side of things. So when we talk about gamut, we tend to be talking about the colour and colour space. The, the correct term would be actually to be talking about the colour space, really. Mm -hmm. But we tend to use gamut as the colour range of a camera or the colour range of a recording format. And one area where there's a lot of confusion with gamut, and talking about gamuts, is between the gamut of the recording format and the gamut that the camera can actually see. So yes. as an example, we have Sony's uh, cameras that can capture S gamut or S gamut 3, S gamut 3 cine, these different colour spaces that those cameras can capture. But not all of the cameras that have those recording colour spaces have sensors capable of capturing all of that colour space. Um, and that's not because there's anything fundamentally wrong with the camera, it's just some of these colour spaces are so incredibly large mm. that to actually capture all of it requires some very, very clever technology. And in a camera, for example, let's take the FS5 as, as an example, the sensor in that camera just doesn't have the colour filtration needed to capture all of S gamut. In fact, very, very few, few cameras can capture that sort of colour space. Um, so you've got to draw some distinction between the recording container, yep. which might be S gamut. So if the FS5 in that example can record in S gamut. Absolutely, the FS5 yep. can record in S gamut. And then what the camera can actually see which is a sensor limitation, so it can't see all of S gamut. The sensor in the FS5 can see something that approaches S gamut 3 dot cine. It's a pretty big color space. Um, and frankly, there's very few TVs or displays that can show these, these color spaces in their entirety any, anyway, so you know, don't get too hung up that, oh my God, my FS5 can't capture that. You know, it's not, not really a problem. But what you do need is that you record the colours that the camera can see in the correct values, in the correct yep. known spaces, so that when it goes into post-production and you apply the LUT or whatever it is you do in post, that the colours don't look weird or strange. So it's about, you know, the, the camera records this particular shade of red and we then need to record it at this particular numerical value so that when that goes into post-production, that numerical value is again converted into a viewable colour and it looks the right colour. So you need to have these gamuts to give a bigger range than 709, which is a very small colour gamut. Um, but there can be limitations depending on the sensor that you're using and, and various other things as to what can actually be put in that gamut that you're recording. So it's important to, to have that distinction. So what would you say is, are the real world implications of a gamut. Why should people even be concerned with which one they have selected? Right, so it's very, very important uh, if you're using lookup tables. Right. 
Also very, very important if you're using any form of color managed workflow. Yep. Because if you record with the wrong color gamut, that shade of red that should be recorded at a value of, let's say 100, just picking a number out of the air, yep. gets into post-production, but you've used the wrong gamut and it's been recorded at a value of, let's say 75, now you get into post-production and your reds don't look red because yep. the values are incorrect. So it's really important that the camera is set up with the right gamut so that when that goes into post-production and the LUT perhaps that's expe expecting that gamut and those values works correctly or your color managed workflow if that's what you're using which is expecting that certain range of colors also works correctly. If you just mix and match randomly different gamuts then you get some really strange results with your colors in post-productions you might get color shifts when you try and change saturation and all sorts of things. And one other thing to add to that is that each of these gamma curves or, and gamuts, they tend to come in pairs. So you'll typically see somebody recommending that you use S gamut 3 with S gamut 3 dot cine or S gamut 3 with S gamma 3. And mm -hmm. they're actually designed to work that way. So as the picture becomes brighter and it goes up that gamma curve, you also want the color response to be changing and the way the color is re recorded in the correct manner so that the color isn't overtaking the brightness or the brightness is overtaking the color. So the gamut and the gamma work together to give you a color accurate end result. So you shouldn't be mixing S gamut, which was designed for S log 2, mm -hmm. for example, with S log 3 because it will give you some unpredictable color results. I guess that answers the, the obvious question that people might have with this, which is, well, if, if more colors is better, why don't we just have one super wide color gamut, which all the cameras record in, and whatever that camera can see just captures a portion of that. Why is that not the way that it works? Why do we still have all these choices? Well, the other thing is you've got to think about your recording bucket and your, your codec and what you're using. It has a finite amount of space. Mm -hmm. So the bigger the color range, the bigger the color range that we try and put in that recording space, the less tonal values, the less values per color that we end up with. Because yeah. we've only got a thousand values in a 10-bit recording. If we try and yeah. put 10,000 in there, then we've got to divide everything by 10. So we have less accuracy, less Absolutely. precision. And of course, so, we'll do a whole, whole episode on bit depth and things like that. A whole, yeah, a whole different thing. So we don't really want to use a bigger gamut than, that, that is way bigger than the camera can ever actually capture. It's just a waste of, of data. So we want to find that happy balance between capturing a big enough color range so we can get all of the colors that we want in an efficient way to fit in our recording that we're using. And so that when it gets to post-production, we're not stretching things out. We're, we're getting a, a, you know, starting with something that's close or reasonably close to what the end range will be. So it's, it's about striking a balance from capture to post to display with gamut. So yeah, you could argue, let's capture the entire visible spectrum or have a recording gamut that, that covers the entire visible spectrum, every single color that exists. The reality is there's virtually no camera that can actually capture that. So what's the point in having this enormous value that we're going to try and record in a very small space in our codec, because we're actually going to waste half of the data in our codec Absolutely. by doing that. Yeah. So it, it's getting that right balance. Um, and, and most of the camera manufacturers are really good at, at that. You know, so most of the camera manufacturers that have their own different gamuts and things like that have, have done a lot of research into this is the codec that we're probably going to be using. So this is what the sensor can actually see. And this is what people will actually want to work with. And in fact, there was a guy way back called Pointer who went out with a color meter around the world and measured the gamut of the things that we see because okay. there's a very big difference between the visible spectrum and that's what potentially everything that we could see yes. and the things that we actually do see in yes. our everyday lives and he went out and he measured what it is in you know that people see in the real world in, in their everyday lives and he, what he discovered was that the gamut that most people actually see, um, if you were to plot it on a chart, isn't actually that much bigger than Rec. 709. So, mm. And you can, you, you can look it up online, pointers gamut, and you yep. can plot it and you can see it. And you'll see that it's nowhere near the full visible spectrum. 
And the argument there is, of course, well, why bother trying to capture the whole visible spectrum if real-world colours just don't go there? Just capture what we need, capture what the real-world colours are, makes the whole system more efficient, and that's how we're going to get the best end result. And actually, um, sort of S gamut 3 Cine, um, DCI P3 is a gamut you'll probably come across, which is very similar to S gamut 3, uh, 3 Cine. They're all around about the same size as pointers gamut, because that tends to be what you need. You don't need everything. So how should people decide which one to choose? Right, so choosing which gamut to use. First of all, choose your colour gamut or a colour gamut that matches the gamma curves that you're using. They're, so, they're linked. So they're linked. Because if you use, let's, an, an example would be if you chose to shoot with 709 gamma mm -hmm. with S gamut, mm -hmm. what you're going to find is that when you take that into post production, you start grading it. If you change the brightness of the colours, the saturation, not only will the, the colour intensity change, but the hue will shift. Mm -hmm. because the gamma curve expects you know, the, the colour to change in a certain way with brightness. Well, mm -hmm. it's not going, it's going to behave in a different way because that gamut's designed differently. So you need, first of all, to, to work with your correct, reasonable pairs. So 709 generally with 709 colour, or at least a colour space designed to work with 709 gamma. When you're shooting with S-Log3, s Gamut 3 or S Gamut 3 dot Cine, they're designed to work together. So you don't want to sort of mix and match too much, otherwise, you can create yourself post production headaches later on. Thanks for watching, I hope that was helpful. Keep in mind, we also do a whole range of Pro AV Academy workshops held right here in our UK showroom, where we cover a whole range of topics from audio to post production, camera techniques, business tips, lighting tips, and many more. The main aim of these workshops is to help our customers learn and develop their skills. And there's something about face-to-face -face training which can just never be replaced by videos like this one. So if you're in the UK, please do get a ticket from the link down below and join us for Pro AV Academy.